Thank you for listening to our 2023 CKF webinar series. I can't believe we are already on number seven. Uh, this webinar will focus on understanding the medical talk through the transplant process. Discovering you need a transplant can be an extremely uh, confusing and scary time. Often recipients and their support systems can become overwhelmed with all of the new terms and procedures. Uh, this webinar aims to give them advice on how to cope with the changes. Uh, my name is Anna Morgan Pilardi. I am the Program and Communications Director for the Chris Kluge Foundation, or CKF, and I will be introducing you to today's panelists. If you'd like, uh, first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, uh, Hearts for Us Foundation, who helped make this series possible. Um, they do some wonderful work in the Donate Life community. If you haven't already, please check them out. Uh, thank you all who have submitted uh, questions ahead of today's session. If you have further questions for today's panelists, please send them through info at chrisklugfoundation.org. If you are interested in other topics we will be discussing during this year's series or any that we've touched on previously, head to chrisklugfoundation.org slash CKF webinar series. Now I'd like to take a moment and introduce all of today's panelists and give them a moment to introduce themselves um, and any organizations they're working for. So first I'd like to introduce Denise Redeker. Denise is a heart transplant recipient, the founder of Heartfelt Help Foundation and is a CKF ambassador. Thanks for joining us, Denise. Thanks so much for having me, Anna. Um, I am super excited for this conversation. Um, as Anna said, my name is Denise Redeker. I am a 2018 heart transplant recipient um, and in 2020 founded Heartfelt Health Foundation. Um, and our mission statement is that we want to uh, ensure that every heart transplant recipient here in Northern California has access to clean, safe, uh, affordable post-transplant housing. Uh, we help transplant patients both source and pay for the housing um, that does not cover, is not covered by insurance and can be financially devastating to patients in financial need. Okay, so next we have Dr. Aline, a heart transplant recipient and medical professional. Hi, I'm Aline Grogosian. I am a heart transplant recipient from 2019, so I'm coming on five years almost. Uh, I'm also a physician. I am an ER and ICU trained doctor. I work mostly as an intensivist and most recently became an associate medical director at an organ procurement organization. Next, I'm going to throw it to Megan. Megan is our last guest speaker. She is a liver transplant recipient and currently works for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society as a campaign development manager. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, so I had uh, my liver transplant in 1994. So I was seven at the time. And um, uh, so I can bring the pediatric side of it to you today. Um, but I'm just happy to be here. Thank you, Megan. Thank you all for joining us. Um, and without further ado, let's delve into some questions. Um, up first, uh, Megan, when you were first diagnosed with a liver condition, and then you discovered you would need a transplant. What was your reaction? I mean, obviously you were younger. So um, how did that affect you and how did you cope with that news? So um, when I was born, um, I was the second child. My um, mom will tell you that my liver or that my diapers were lopsided um, when I was born. And that was um, in, um, in, what's the right word? Um, that was because of my enlarged liver is what they later found out. Um, but around three or four, they, um, diagnosed me with alpha one antitrypsin deficiency. Um, and, um, it, they said that I would need a liver transplant one day, but of course at three or four, you don't really understand that. I just understand, like, I don't feel good. And one, and one day we're gonna get to feel better. Um, and then at the age of seven, I, um, <clears throat> passed out during a spelling test and, um, I ended up going to the pediatrician and they said it was time, um, that my liver numbers had, um, my liver was officially failing and, um, that it, we went from zero to zero to hundred. I spent about six weeks in the hospital. Um, and went from not being on the list, being a number one child in the Southeast that needed a transplant. Um, and, um, honestly it was, 
Um, child life played a huge role in my um, pediatric hospital stay because um, while it was scary um, and not fully grasping the concept of having a life-saving surgery at the age of seven, um, I had a mom who was a nurse and she did her best to explain things to me. Um, and um, then child life really stepped up and played um, and showed me kind of the pediatric, like the, on the doll and showed me like what to expect and um, how things were going to go and what I was going to wake up with and that kind of thing. Um, I don't really think, um, I think it was more of a um, long-term uh, coping um, thing growing up is on the flip end of, yes, I did receive this life-saving transplant, but growing up, I had to really comprehend what that meant afterwards, um, whether that was taking medicine for the rest of my life, going to doctor's appointments, um, advocating for myself. So um, uh, it's definitely an everyday process. I don't think it's something that we ever get used to. Thanks for sharing, Megan. Yeah, I definitely, I can't imagine, you know, it's hard enough for an adult trying to understand um, what they're being told, let alone a, a child, and especially as a mother or a, a support network for that child, trying to explain to them what they're going through um, must be so hard um, on on the whole family as, as one. Um, next, I'm going to move to Aline. As a medical professional and transplant recipient, you've had quite a unique journey. Um, do you feel being a medical professional has helped you during your diagnosis and recovery? Um, there also had to be times where even with your profession, uh, you did not fully understand the information or it was slightly different to what you'd experienced. Um, how did you deal with that? Um, sure. Yeah, I think that that's a great question. Um, you know, a lot of people assume that I went to medical school and did residency because of my transplant, because that's always that's that's very commonly a reason for people to become doctors. But I had already been a doctor for several years, not several, three years when I got my transplant. So I was already well into, you know, the, the medical profession. I had been an ER resident at the time and I had just gotten into a critical care fellowship. So um, I was like basically towards the end of my training. And so all of my health issues happened to me towards the end of my training when I already was immersed in, you know, healthcare, but in a different way, um, like, you know, taking care of other people. So, and, and people also assume that because of that, I probably knew everything that was going on, but that's actually not the case. Like I was an ER doctor trainee. I wasn't, you know, there, there was only so much that I understood about transplant. I think in medical school, we probably learn I don't know, maybe like a couple of lectures at most from the hundreds that we get on transplantation. Um, and then, you know, even during residency and fellowship, like unless you're working with transplant patients all the time, you know, in the ER, I'd probably see one every few months, right? It's very rare to have a transplant. So I, I knew enough about it to help me through the process, but there was still a lot that was new to me. Um, and, and I think, but the, the type of personality that I have, I feel like it almost made me like less scared. Like, like, you know, I was like, well, it was either going to happen or I'm going to die. Right. Like it, it almost made me kind of understand things in a, in a more, um, in, in kind of a different way. So, uh, so yeah, it was, it was very interesting kind of having, um, you know, both sides perspective, but again, I, there was a lot and there still continues to be a lot that I don't know because, you know, transplantation is not my is not the profession that I chose to do. I, I do I do take care of transplant recipients and transplant ICUs, but that's not the same. Um, and of course, it takes it takes a whole you know, it's a multidisciplinary team, um, which just goes to show how complicated transplant is. And it's not as easy as people think it is. Like if you're a doctor, you know it all. So it was a very interesting process for me. I think that's so important. Yeah, every transplant story is completely different. You know, everyone, even if you have the same transplant, you know, uh, Aline and Denise, both heart transplant recipients, I am sure they're completely different, you know, journeys, stories. And, you know, you really, it's important to hear, even with a medical background, you still have uh, learning to do. Um, and you're not the only one out there who doesn't, you know, know what's going on or may not know what you're being told at some point. Okay, next we're going to jump to Denise. How important is it to become 
educated about your condition and the transplant that you need. On top of that, if you feel as though more can sort of be done by your doctor or a different approach can be taken, is it appropriate to make that request? And how can an individual relay that information? Wow, um, two huge questions. Um, and actually, I think they kind of go together well. Um, it is literally life-saving to become educated in your own condition. Um, you must, you must know what you've got, what you're dealing with, um, what the treatments are, what the side effects of the medication are. You must become educated as to every aspect of your transplant, your um, your under any underlying conditions that you might have. Um, you you must. It it can literally save your life. Um, and and it also goes a long way towards building a relationship with your transplant team um, when they know that you know. And when they know that you are well educated and that you are also um, moderated in your opinion, that you are well researched, that you um, that you are going to approach any conversation with your team with um, all due respect and, and knowing that you guys are working together as a team. Um, for me, building a partnership with a, a really true partnership with my transplant team has been critical in my health and my well being and my, my, um, my condition, my condition success, my success with transplant so far. Um, and, when you build that team, that trust with your team, it also gives you the ability to speak to them about um, conditions you might have, treatment plans that you might have, researched, questions you want to ask. They're going to take you a whole lot more seriously if they know that you are well researched in the issue. Um, my my personal lived example is not long ago I had a series of um, of symptoms that I had been monitoring for a bit before I called my team and was able to say, okay, these are my symptoms. This is how long I've been having them. These are what I think the next steps ought to be. What do you think? Um, usually the response when I say something like that to my team is, this is why you're my favorite patient, uh, <laughs> which I love. And, and, and usually, you know, I'm either I'm either close to right or we work together to create a plan that's that's similar to what I might have suggested. Um, and but but we only have that relationship. We're only doing those things because we've both done the work to build the trust. Right. I think you summed it up there. It's a partnership. I think a lot of people think transplant is kind of this like job done. You got the transplant and you're off. And it's not, it's a continuous process. And the better relationship, the better knowledge you have, the easier it is for your team to help you. Um, I want to throw that out and see if Megan or Eileen had anything they wanted to add to that. Yeah. Um, I think, I think what you said is so important, Denise. Um, I do think that every patient is also different, right? Like I come across patients who are very like, you know, just do what you got to do. Don't tell me anything more. I don't want to know this. I don't want to know this. And then there's patients who come in with like, like, you know, our, our anatomy textbook from medical school, and they're like asking all these specific questions. So I think it's also, you know, as, as a physician, um, I always say like, you should ask as many questions as you want, but you should also tell your doctor or your team what you want to know and how much in depth you want to know. There are plenty of people, like even my dad, for example, like he went to the doctor and he, and the doctor had asked him like, Oh, so what do you want to do? Like with this pain or whatever it had been. Um, and then my dad came and he's like, I, sh she's so dumb. Like she told, she asked me what I wanted. She didn't just tell me what to do. Like, you know, it's, it's, it was so so again it's like there's cultural differences um individual differences and then there's generational differences too so uh but but i always tell people like 
you know, educate yourself, ask questions as much as you want. And then, you know, also, you can also very easily tell, inform your team, like, hey, I'm someone who likes to know a little bit more. Like, I'm someone who doesn't really care about, like, the little details that maybe, you know, show up red in my lab results, but it doesn't really mean anything clinically. Um, so, you know, it, it, there's a good balance. And and I'm telling you, I, again, I'm a, I'm a young physician, so maybe I don't have a lot of experience, but my experience thus far is that, is there are people who are just like, I don't want to know anything. <laughs> like, it's very interesting. <laughs> I think it's important to like, make sure that you're comfortable asking questions. Like if, like she said, that if there is a lab value that, um, that shows up red, you can be like, Hey, it's red. Is it, are we cool? You know, um, <laughs> or last time it wasn't red and now it's red. Or did I do something wrong? Um, you know, <clears throat> something like that. Like I, um, cause of course I didn't start paying attention to my labs until very later in life. And so, um, I know that I will ask questions and I'm like, okay, so can I do anything to make this better? Or do we think this was just a fluke? Um, what exactly is this number and how does it affect me? Like I took my medicine at seven thirty instead of seven, you know, like, is it that big of a deal or is it something like, you know, it fluctuates kind of thing. And a lot of times it's just, it fluctuates. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think just being comfortable enough just to ask questions and to be like involved with your care. And I know that education levels across the board, you know, not everybody is going to know what all these medical terms are and that's okay. Like just know that it's okay to ask. Like, and I, I, I think they would rather you ask and be knowledgeable than to not ask and to just go with the flow <laughs> and be like, Oh, okay. You know, I think that's a great point. And, and I like the fact that you pointed out that, you know, you weren't looking at your charts. It obviously, it doesn't just affect a transplant recipient. This could be something that's affecting a parent or a supporter. I know uh, my brother-in-law is on the list and he's definitely one of those that does not want to know the information. He just is like, I know what I'm doing. I'm good. It's as long as everything keeps going good, we're good. And his mom is going, but what does that one mean? And what does that mean? And, you know, even if you're in that position, make sure, you know, you're a supporter. You're welcome to ask those questions too. You know, you're in there every day. You're the one supporting. Make sure that you raise your hand and say, can someone go over this with me? <laughs> um, so I think that's definitely important as, as well. As someone who so gonna... grew up on child life therapy, I'm like, child life it for me. Like, I need it in the simplest of terms. <laughs> And um, how is yep. this going to affect me long term? Um, I'm like, yep. I'm like, when you grew up with child life, I'm like, child life me. Tell me, tell me yep. as simple as you can go. And then if I want the details, my mom has probably already researched it because she's a nurse too. And so she's like, she's like, I already got the questions and just thankful she's, they're thankful she's not in the room at this point in the journey, bless. But because um, she's like, no, I already looked at it. I already told you this is what this number was. <laughs> And I'm like, it's different for everyone, mom. Calm down. Just calm down. Hang on. Just hang on. It's pretty funny. <laughs> That's great. Thank you for sharing, Megan. Um, Aline, I'm going to go back to you. Uh, what resources can individuals utilize to become a self-advocate and educated about medical talk surrounding transplants? Sure. There's a lot of, there's a lot of information on the internet, right? Like, I feel like there's almost too much and you never know what's right. You never know what you should be looking at. Um, so as a medical professional, I am going to put in a little plug for AST, American Society of Transplantation. I am the chair of one of their transplant um, community advice, one of their committees for transplant community. Um, and so, you know, Power to Save, which is the the website, it's kind of the the patient facing um, section of AST. Uh, you know, they have great resources, any sort of, you know, governmental organization, hospital associated organization. So if you want to go to like Mayo Clinic or if you go to Cedar sinai anything that is kind of, um, uh, I don't want to say like it's confirmed, like confirmed to be true by uh, some sort of uh, governing body, whether it's a hospital, CDC, NIH, uh, AST, these are all really important things that that people should be going to for resources more often than not what i hear is like i read this on facebook and i'm like oh just like be careful of what you read on social media and always make sure another thing that i point out to people is if people are giving you resources so for example you go to like xyz.com whatever it is that 
you think might have good resources, see if there's any citations. So at the end of their pamphlet or website or whatever it may be, um, if they are citing appropriate sources with you know peer-reviewed literature, if they are citing CDC, if they are citing specific things, um, then you know it's legitimate. And so I tell people to always go to peer-reviewed kind of um, and, and institutional-based like organizations, websites that have the best information. With that being said, I still think it's totally fine to, you know, I, I, this is like a common thing. When I first got my transplant, the way I found my community was through social media. I found Denise that way. I found many people that way. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't like talk to others or like look at everything that you see, but just you can always, always have your team, you know, double check the information and, um, and kind of go from there. But yeah, finding sources, Legitimate sources with appropriate citations is where people should be looking for their resources. I'd never thought of the citation. That's yeah. a great way to great yeah. way to point it out. Um, never thought of that. And I think, yeah, you're right. It's there's a right time and place for everything, as they say. And social media has its right time and right place. It just needs to not get muddled with um, the totally fine professional to opinion. You social media. Yeah. Sometimes those discussions is what brings those patients into the, you know, to the clinic saying like, hey, I read this somewhere. That's totally appropriate. But just don't just like believe everything that necessarily doesn't have a citation or hasn't been reviewed. Did anyone else want to add anything where they might have found during the, the process? Um, anywhere they utilized? Um, I went to a transplant camp as a as a young adult or as a teen. Um, and that was really beneficial because like you got to have fun, but also you learn. And uh, I went to the one in Michigan and it's called Camp Michitonki. Um, But they also have um, Flying Horse Farms, Camp Turtle. There's one in California too. Very cool places to go for young adults. And then they even have like sibling camps too. So that's nice so that siblings can bond on that level as well. Um, but yeah, so I go back and volunteer um, during the summer now because I'm too old to be a camper, but you know. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a young one at heart. That's what I tell them. Y'all really just, um, but like, I like to show them that like, just because, you know, yes, I'm 37 and yes, I have a big grown up job, but like, I think it's important to like, make sure that they know like, Hey, just because you have a transplant doesn't mean that you can't go up and above and beyond whatever you want to do, whether you want to be a welder or you want to be a manager at Walmart or you want to be a physician. I mean, the world is, an, is your oyster. Like you get just because you've had a transplant doesn't mean that there's not extra resources out there to help you along the way. Right. I think actually just to piggyback or go back a little bit um, and piggyback on what both Aline and uh, Megan said is um, when you're when you're creating and learning how to be your own advocate, when this is I mean, this is all new to you at some point. Right. You've you've just been diagnosed or you've just received a transplant. You've got to learn how to be an advocate. We're not born that way. At least most of us aren't. I certainly wasn't. Um, and finding your community um, can go a long way to teaching you how to be an advocate um, and and teaching you how to speak up for yourself is finding other people who have walked that path. Um, I've learned a lot from Aline. Um, I've learned a lot from Aline um, <laughs> over the last few years. And, um, you know, in all honesty, Going to a traditional support group meeting for me was a horrible experience because it was a bunch of people who didn't look like me, who didn't sound like me, who were definitely not my age and and finding people on social media who were closer to my age, looked like me. Um, I've learned so much from other patients that I hope to someday meet in person, but but won't. And it's taught me a lot or, or may, may or may not meet, uh, be able to meet in person, but haven't yet. But it's taught me so much about how to be an advocate, what questions to ask, what other centers are doing for their patients that my center may not be doing or what my center is doing for other patients that other centers aren't doing. Um, it's it's really um, a tool in your tool belt to learn how to be the best advocate you can be, to learn about how to understand 
lab results, test results, what, uh, what questions, what are the right questions to ask? It's not just, you know, Googling every symptom that comes up because that can lead you down a weird little rabbit hole. But, um, but also, you know, talking it through with people who are going down the same path as you are. Yeah, I think that's so important to connect. And, you know, we always say every transplant story is different. Every transplant story is different. You always hear that. They're different, but there are ways that you can help and support each other. There are similarities. There may be an experience you've been through that you can find someone through these support groups, through the social media that has been through a similar um, process that can help you and guide you um, and through that. You just sort of have to reach out and say, help um, is the famous term, as they say. <laughs> okay, so next we're going to look to Megan. What do you feel are the most important questions that you asked your doctor pre and um, well, for you, it may not have been yourself, but uh, <laughs> your family uh, pre and post transplant? I think things have changed. It's almost been 30 years. So a lot of my stuff is probably not as quote relevant, I guess, anymore. Um, but um, even to this day is like long term side effects of things you know, what does this medication do? How long do I need to take it? Um, I know I got sick with COVID um, two years ago and that changed a lot for me because that was the first time that I'd been like really sick in a very long time. And so that brought up a lot of questions, but it was a new experience. I know I, I do. I think that's so important though, is that sort of saying it, it does change and, you know, through your journey, every time it's going to change. And you're never too through your too far through your journey to ask a question, um, and sort of want to throw that out to to Aline and, and Denise. Have you got anything you want to add there? Yeah, I think I think another important thing to realize is you know it obviously it depends on age and all that, but acute versus chronic, right? Acute versus chronic organ failure is so different. Um, everything that happened to me, I had familial dilated cardiomyopathy that kind of had like a very, literally a sudden onset. Like I didn't know I had this, you know, genetic uh, like de defect until after my, basically after my transplant. So, um, I, I had no question, like, I feel like I, you know, I had to get resuscitated and then they told me I needed a transplant and, and then I kind of processed it after the fact. So I didn't have years to think about, you know, chronic heart failure and what it means and what questions to ask. Mine was kind of like an urgent listing. Uh, and so that's another thing to take into consideration is like the process is very different for people who are going through something acutely versus more likely people have something chronic. And by chronic, I mean a few months, a few years, sometimes even, you know, eight, nine years until they get a transplant. Um, and so there is no wrong question to ask. There's that. And as long as you feel comfortable asking um, your team, that's also very important. And everybody's going to ask, like, I mean, I don't even think I, we had questions before my transplant, but post transplant, I was like, oh, you know, are these side effects of these medications going to interfere with, you know, my medical career? Like, you know, I had, I had those types of questions more so, you know, and, and I think it, again, it's very dependent on the individual and, and the issue that they have and how long it's been. Thank you. Well, yeah, I think, you know, you change your, you're going through so much as, as you're going through this, or you may not be aware that you're going through this and it's emergency transplant. Um, and it's okay to not want to ask questions at one point and then suddenly have 10 million questions later on. You know, there's no guideline of, of how many questions to ask or, or when to ask them. You can really, you know, that's what your transplant team is there for. That's what organizations, um, OPOs, et cetera, uh, support groups are there for is to be able to go and have a safe place to ask those questions and make sure you ask your medical professionals as well. Okay, next I'd like to go to Denise. Uh, while the organ may be transplanted into the recipient, often the recipient's family is there with them through the entire process. Um, is there a way you can utilize your loved ones when working to understand the medical talk? I think it's vital. Um, I, I think it's vital to include your family members in all of the conversation. Um, I know for me um, and every, as, as we've all said repeatedly, everybody's adventure with transplant is different. Um, for me, I had three open heart surgeries in a week. 
Um, and there was so much, I had so much anesthesia. I've decided I, I'm not great with anesthesia. I don't come out of it well. And it took me a solid week and a half to two weeks before I was lucid enough to have a, a non anesthesia induced conversation. And so having my, uh, my husband, my son, my family members there to be able to ask the questions that they thought I would ask, um, that, that they, th they thought I would need to know so that they could convey them to me later was, was vital. And again, not underestimating it kind of life-saving. Um, and, and I think that's really important. And I think it's kind of important also to know going into this process that you may not be able to take in the answers to the questions or formulate the questions immediately after surgery as well as somebody else. And so having that conversation before your transplant with the people who are going to be there with you and say, Hey, you're going to be my eyes and ears during this, um, initial recovery process until I can speak for myself and, and we're all confident and, and comfortable with the fact that I can understand and I can speak for myself. I think it's really important that you be my eyes and ears for that. Are you willing to do that? Are you able to do that? Um, and for lack of a better word, curate the people and, and train the people who are going to be your eyes and ears immediately post transplant. And that may mean I, I've known patients, um, particularly that may mean making sure that there's another person other than your immediate family member that's there in those initial couple of days, because that person is very analytical and is answering, can, can ask the questions and take in the information maybe better than your immediate next of kin. Um, so understanding what's going to be, um, asked of you and the information that's going to be relayed to you immediately post transplant and making sure that the person that's there with you really has a grasp on it so that they can convey it to you, I think is really important. Thanks for sharing that, Denise. I know I've seen a lot of different techniques and people say, well, I did this. And one that kind of stood out to me was, uh, one recipient who was actually on a webinar of us previously, she said, well, I had five family members and so I broke them up into different teams and we all took on a different area of my transplant and became professionals at knowing what was going on in that area. But like there was a finance person, an insurance person, housing, recovery. And I was like, okay, I mean, that works. Whatever works for you and your family. But, you know, remember that you're not alone going through it and you do have those support systems there. So use them to the to the fullest. Um, so before I close out today's session, I would like to just ask a spontaneous question of everybody. Um, if you could give some knowledge to somebody currently who's just been diagnosed or um, going through the process or a family member um, looking for some, some support regarding understanding the t medical talk, what advice would you give to them? Sure. I think um, one really important piece of advice, we I think we've said it several times here, but that every single patient is different and to not compare yourself to others. So if you ever have a question, um, it's totally OK to bring it up to your medical professional that like so and so has this going on. But always keep in mind that every single person's body and every single person's journey is very different. So comparing yourself doesn't always help. 100% agree. Um, and also, if I had a dime for every time a patient has said, well, I just feel like I'm asking too many questions. You're not. Um, ask all the questions that you want to ask. You are, there's, there's, I don't think there's a possibility that you could, you could ever ask too many questions. Even if you're asking the same question again, because you don't understand the answer, ask it again. Um, ask it three times if you need to. Ask it four times if you need to. Um, make sure that you are leaving the office um, or the phone call or the video chat or the email um, with an understanding of what the answer to your question was. Um, and I think I'll tack on to that is um, utilize the different members of your team. Um, you know, I know social work was a huge part of my journey. 
um, after transplant. Um, cause when I turned 18 and I got a job with benefits, like that's great, but I've also lost my job and been laid off twice. Um, and I really tapped into, um, social work resources and like, um, asking about, you know, medication coverage. Um, a lot of the medications have copay cards and that kind of thing. So, you know, they're there for you to utilize those. Um, so don't be afraid to ask for that kind of help as well. Um, uh, because it is, it is cumbersome. Um, and also mentally, um, it's a lot. And so don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, I know 29 years down the road, um, counseling is still, part of my journey. And, um, it's something that I started later in life. Um, and, um, you know, PTSD is part of, part of that, uh, that I acquired. And so, um, but you really utilize all parts of the team. Um, I think it's huge. Um, and establishing that relationship with your coordinator, um, being that I'm not somebody that's going to call just because I coughed, you know, the wrong way I contact my primary for that. You know what I mean? Um, because I'm far enough out to do so. But, um, but like when it came to transplant time, I would call my coordinator and was like, you know, can I take this med or can I do this or can I do that? But really rely on them. Um, and, uh, utilize your resources, um, that are offered to you. Amazing. Thank you all. Um, for all of your advice and, and sharing all of your knowledge and your journeys. Um, I'd like to close out today's session by just thanking everyone who's tuning in and checking out this webinar series. We hope that you found today's session inspiring and informative. Again, if you have any questions for today's panel, or you want to learn more about this year's webinar series, head to chrisklugfoundation.org slash CKF webinar series. We hope you have a great rest of your day and stay safe, stay healthy and live life, give life. <laughs>